is a question I have for you. Why is it so hard to be authentic <laughs> when we're thinking about what we're going to say? Just like now, before I turned on the camera and started recording, I was thinking about <clears throat> the question I was going to ask. And immediately, I'm rehearsing, practicing in my mind what I'm going to say. And this rehearsal takes the authenticity out of the conversation. There's a paradox here. We want to be able to communicate well, professionally, in a thought-out way that makes sense to people. Because one of the cornerstones of good communication is, is picking the right words and conveying meaning in a way that really reaches people. And if you can't do that, then you're never going to get a mess message across, right? And it seems to me like one of the best ways to do that is to rehearse what you say, to practice what you say, to think about what you say before you start to speak. And yet somehow this is, uh, this is breeding grounds for inauthenticity. And I don't, I don't know what the solution is. It's just it's something that I've become very aware of. When I watch myself talk on camera, the first few um, minutes or so, maybe the first 20 to 30 seconds, are very inauthentic. I'm, I'm putting on a show, and I feel myself doing it right now. I'm putting on a show, and um, and I don't know. They're, they're, at some point, uh, here, here's what it is. When, when I hit a topic that I'm deeply passionate about, where I know exactly what I want to say already, well, I guess it's kind of obvious. I'm not going to be trying to put put on a show. I stop thinking. I stop reflecting. I stop seeing myself as I speak. Because this is the this is the root cause, isn't it? If we are watching ourselves as we talk, if we are imagining in our eyes the person watching us and we're managing their expectations, which is what I'm doing right now, then it's very, very difficult for us to be authentic. So there's there's only one thing to do, which is to just talk to talk um, until you hit a topic that that you get so excited by that you forget that people are watching you. You forget to, to manage people's expectations. And I think that's especially hard for some of us who have somehow, <laughs> who have somehow um, spent a lot of time in the past. We've grown up with a very strong managing expectations attitude. That means we've spent a lot of mental resources thinking about how people see us and how we can change their perception of us, right? You know what they say? If, um, first impressions last. You should always make a good first impression. If you take that to heart, which, which I ha have done in the past, then you'll be constantly thinking about how people perceive you. And that... Um, that, that puts you in a difficult position. And I think um, for me, it meant that I was always somebody completely different in different scenarios. And in scenarios where um, I wasn't being very proactive about who I was being, um, I was still managing people's expectations, but unconsciously um, and, and sometimes in negative ways, if that makes sense. Like, for example, um, in the face of authority, usually I... I I used to very much, and I do this less, but I still do it. I used to become very small physically. <laughs> I would, you know, crouch, and uh, and my voice would become very quiet. And because I was, I guess, you know, this is unconscious. Like I wasn't consciously thinking about, oh, I better make myself small. But I think unconsciously, I was trying to, you know, not <laughs> wake the dragon of authority. Right? Um, somebody who has so much power over you, you don't want to. Um, make it appear in any way that you're a threat. Um, and I, I don't know if that worked. I mean, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, but at the end of it, it's, it's kind of irrelevant, isn't it? I mean, what matters is how you feel about yourself at the end of the day. Do you want to go around and live a life where you feel like you've been che cheating people or you've been tricking people into treating you the way you want? Or do you want to live in a place where people are treating you the way you want because you know, they care about you, they trust you, and they're good people too. And this is hard because, you know, we don't live in a world where everybody is trustworthy, where everyone will care about you. And so, um, and this is something that Brene Brown talks about in her new book, Rising Strong, when we become more authentic, 
we also become more fierce about protecting our boundaries and we become much, much more aware of our boundaries because we realize that if we if we just say you know if, if we if we're a rollover which you know which is what i used to be in in the face of authority then <clears throat> there's no question of um of what did i want to say I don't know. I don't remember how these two topics fit together properly, but, but, yeah. When you're in the face of authority, and the, you know, you're you're, you're shrinking, you're not being authentic. Then there's no question of whether or not you are, um, um, you know, letting people, uh, you know, whether you have boundaries. You you don't have boundaries, <laughs> or your boundaries are you're the boss. I'll do whatever you say, right? So there's not really a boundary here. But when you start to be authentic you know, you start to show up as your full self, be, being confident, then if people tell you to do something, you need to be very critical. You know, is this the right thing for me to do? Because otherwise, again, you're just putting on a facade, right? You're just putting on the I'm confident face, but deep inside you're still doing whatever they say, which is kind of the definition of authority, right? Um, and I don't know why that's really important for me, but I think, yeah, I guess to me, I think people should, nobody should have power of anybody else. Um, and I don't know if that's it's, if that's fully possible. I mean, I, I mean, it, it is it is possible, but it requires us to um, to have a lot more options, right? Like, if you if somebody has something you want and they're the only person who has what you want, then they have power over you. There's no way around it. So the only way to get rid of that power is to give people options about who to go to. Imagine that uh, if you want something resolved, which, this is a memory that I have, I'm going to talk to the dean of the law school where I did my undergraduate, and I didn't finish a law degree, but at one point I had to I talked to the dean, and I went in and I was very small. And um, if I went in there and was very confident, and then they gave me a, an answer that, that I didn't like, then... There's nothing I can do about it, right? So, so it, it, I'm just putting on a face of being confident, but I have no power towards this person. Now, maybe I can get a better outcome by being more confident or something else. But again, this is very outcome based. But at the end of the day, I have to feel confident. And if I, if people are just deciding about my fate <laughs> without me having any ability to influence that strongly, then that my confidence erodes, of course, right? So that's why the power stru structures are very damaging to us. But the alternative is. Uh, must be that there, there's um, multiple people to go to to have something like that done, right? So instead of just ha being able to only go to the dean, if I could talk to you know three people at the university, you all had the same um, uh, ability to to you know give certain things to students, and you know I could choose who to go to and and go to all three of them if I wanted to, then I certainly would have a lot more power because I would feel like I I could negotiate. Um, with different people and get possibly different results. Um, but of course it requires that that person also has um, individual responsibility and is not just simply following a rule book. And I think this is kind of a fundamental question. Do we want to live in a, in a world where humans are just following a set of rules or do we want to live in a world where people are autonomous? And I think to me it's very obvious now that we want to live in the latter. We want to live in a world where people are able to make decisions autonomously. And organizations which fail to grasp that, which somehow believe that the rules can be better than individual autonomy, they're um, they're gonna fall away and die and, and and hurt all of us along the way. And interestingly, this is something that yeah is, is very closely related to artificial intelligence because there might be some things which where it's better if you follow a strict set of rules. And those things are, generally speaking, things that um, artificial intelligent agents could do in the future. Because if, if it's just a matter of rule following, you don't need to, to have this extremely complex emotional brain that we have to be able to follow lots of rules. And a basic artificial intelligence can do that. So the question is, you know, what do we as humans want to do? Yeah, of course, it's the emotional work, the, the work that requires autonomy um, and, 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 and a sense of purpose and, and all of that. But the the super interesting thing about this is I saw a talk uh, recently where someone who who was an artificial intelligence uh, researcher and, and and programmer 
said that what she found really interesting is that what what the artificial intelligence community is now finding is that the best way to program an an AI system is to create lots of autonomous agents within that system, right? This is kind of mind blowing. Why wouldn't you create a system where there's, for example, um, one good example might be with with drones. Imagine you had a fleet of drones, twenty drones, who whose whose role it is to I don't know pick up rubbish off the street, right? That's, that would be cool. Let's let's you know get the drones to clean the streets. Now you might imagine that the best way to do this is to have you know all the drones can have cameras, and then you have a supercomputer at home base, and the drones send the camera feed to the supercomputer, and the supercomputer will decide uh, on the fly where all the drones will go, right? It turns out this is much less efficient than a distributed system where every drone has a camera and then sees whatever they see and decide for themselves where they will go and pick up rubbish. And, however, still relay information of what they see to the other drones, but not telling the other drones what to do, but so the other drones can also make up their mind, right? So an individual drone sees their own camera feed and gets summary information from all the other drones. You know, that says, for example, if another drone is in a particular area and says, I've seen a lot of rubbish here. Then you get that this one drone gets that information. In that area is a lot of rubbish. Now I can make a decision as the drone. I mean, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing the drone now, but then the drone can make the decision whether to go there or whether to stay there or whether to go anywhere else. And it turns out that these systems, where there's a lot of autonomous agents, artificially intelligent autonomous robots, are far more efficient than a centralized complex robotic system. Um, they're, they're, they're more efficient and they're of course also more, much more resilient because if one aspect, any one part of the system goes down, the, entire, the rest of the system still functions. That individual drone clean, cleaning the streets needs nothing else. They don't need a supercomputer back at home base to tell them what to do. Imagine if that thing goes offline, then all the drones will just stop cleaning, right? But in this case, the drones would just continue doing what they're doing, even if they can't communicate to each other, right? Because it's not necessary, that's just an added benefit. And it turns out that, of course, when we look at, you know, authentic organizations, they're doing the same thing. They're giving people much, much, much more autonomy about how they do their work, what they do, and so on, and letting them interact in really simple ways with other members of the organization. So this is the future. This is, um, I mean, this is, this is how we would like to live. You know, this is, this is how the world actually works. The world doesn't work through um, hierarchical control structures. This, this is just, it's, it's insanity um, when we look at how things actually work. And in fact, one of the things about this is people say, oh yeah, but you know, hierarchical control is better for whatever reasons, you know, we can standardize rules and uh, you know, we, we, we learn from each other, right? So if, if each person is always making decisions for themselves um, and they, then people are not learning from each other, people are not learning from the experience of the past and so on, right? Well. So that this is wrong for a, a number of different reasons. And one of them is that even when you have uh, the perfect set of rules, which, you know, that alone is impossible, right? You'll never have uh, perfection in rules. And in fact, they're more likely to become bloated than to become any good. But when you have, uh, even if you had a perfect set of rules, it, it wouldn't mean that people would always be able to follow the sets of rules. Um, maybe just because they don't have the time to read it and be up to date on the rules, right? Imagine if you had a set of rules that was always updated and always up to date and always the best perfect set of rules. Well, probably it would be extremely long and extremely complex and people would not have the time to stay up to date with it. So the the question is not about how to do it perfect. And and I love a quote from an entrepreneur that that I met many years ago who said, don't let perfect get in the way of better. And traditional hierarchical control structures are just a perfectionist dream when they don't they don't work they just don't work there's another great book about this called um the utopia of rules which is exactly about this topic is that the idea the very human idea that we could somehow make the perfect set of rules that will make life perfect everywhere and and it's a it's a utopian vision in the in the bad sense of the word utopia in the in the sense that it's not possible it's not possible to have a set of rules that is perfect um, which which actually brings me to another thing, which is uh, Stephen Hawking, you know, renowned physicist. This is not a guy to talk of quack shit. The, this guy is, is is one of the, well, I think he is the best theoretical physicist alive. Um, and uh, a friend of mine actually said maybe Stephen Hawking should be the um, uh, should be the 
the messiah figure for science because um his 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 the fact that he's still alive is a is a miracle so if we wanted to 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 have a, a scientific messiah stephen hawking's would be it he's, he's a miracle uh, but <laughs> that aside what stephen hawking says is that um <laughs> Um, and I realized that that doesn't necessarily give credence to the fact that he's a serious scientist, but of course he is. Like, think about, you know, who Stephen Hawking is and where he works and what he does. He's a theoretical physicist. This guy is, you know, one of the most hardcore scientists in the world. So he doesn't talk about things that aren't true. And yet he said that the world is fundamentally or that we as humans must approach the world with a framework called model dependent reality. What that mean what that means is that the only way we can understand the world is through models. And models by definition are not correct. Uh, and the reason for this is simple um, and and it it goes against some of the um some of the, the old western philosophy. We we were kind of stuck in this um platonic way of thinking where we think that uh, the world is made up of uh, simple rules that, are, that just come together to create a complex reality. Um, and it seems to be now that this is actually not the case. This, we, we would like this to be the case. Human beings love patterns. And if there's one simple pattern that describes the whole universe, that would be awesome. But it doesn't work like that. So what Stephen Hawking said is that what, the only thing we can do is create maps of the world. And a map is not useful <laughs> think about this, a map is not useful if it's the same size as the territory that it's describing, right? Imagine, imagine just for a room having a floor plan that was the size of the room. It would be, it could be folded up, it would be the size of an A4 piece of paper, and I'd have to unfold it um, about 20 times, and then it would cover the entire um, floor area of my room and it could describe accurately where the bed is and where everything else is but that would be kind of a very pointless map why the hell would i unfold you know this huge map and take up all the space to look at the thing that's right in front of me even if i took that thing away somewhere else why would i have such a large representation of this space it was much better is to have a small representation to say well the whole thing actually can fit on one a4 piece of paper and that's enough information for me to understand what is going on in this room um, and and I don't need any more, right? Now this is even more obviously true when you think about larger things like the the city. You know, I live in Milan. If I had a, a city map the size of Milan, um, it would you know probably weigh several tons, but um, it would also be totally useless, right? Like um, it wouldn't help me to get around Milan at all. So um, to to have a map be as complex as the reality that it's describing is more or less more or less useless so we want to simplify i mean this is obviously another way too we can represent digitally something that's real in the same level of complexity so instead of having um and actually you can do this right i can open google maps on my phone and i can um turn it onto satellite mode and i can um see um the way that um Milan looks from the air. Now, most of the time, I don't use the map this way. And I think that most of the time you don't use a map like this either. The reason is very simple, because a satellite map doesn't tell you very many useful things that you want to know, because what you actually want to know is where are the streets? Um, well, yeah, in a city map, that's mostly what you want to know, where are the streets? So all you need is a street map. And that's what regular Google Maps does. To, to have a, a, a satellite view is too much detail. It, it makes it very hard to see where the streets are when you have a satellite map. So the point is that um, to 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 re describe reality um, accurately is is actually not what we want. We don't want to describe reality 100% accurately because otherwise we would be overwhelmed with the with the information. So what we do want is to to describe reality. In a, at the right level of simplicity, which means that if you're looking at, if you're driving around or traveling around in a city, you want to see the, the the street map, the the map of the transportation network. That's what you want to see because it's about transportation. Um, if you want to see the, the the vegetation in the world, what you want to see is um, a map, a world map that shows the the vegetation in different areas. 
uh, but nothing else. So, right? So, depending on what you want to see, what you want to understand, you need to have the 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 description, the map, the model uh, represent those things and nothing else. Otherwise, you get overwhelmed, right? So, um, so that's what Stephen Hawking means by model dependent reality. He said that for the only way we can understand the world is through models, and those models, uh, the more important part of the model is to be simple rather than to be comprehensive. Um, and so this this comes back to the idea of the utopia of rules and we would love to have have the perfect set of rules but again perfection in the set of rules um, being able to anticipate any possible scenario through your rules is definitely not what we want because in that case we would be describing you know we, we, the, the rule book would be tens of thousands of pages long to anticipate every possible scenario so it would be useless at that point because nobody could possibly read it. So what we want is a level of simplicity where we do consciously leave things out of the rule book, don't anticipate specific scenarios, um, and focus only on the ones that happen most often. And, um, and, and, and the awesome thing about this is that the human brain is actually very good at doing this naturally. We are able to take in, the unconscious mind especially, is able to take in millions of pieces of information every second and then filters out the things that it thinks is important. So to do a job really well, it's much easier to you know, look at case studies and to talk to other people who have done the same job and so on and then let your intuition figure out what's important than it is to try and consciously codify every all the knowledge and then teach it to people. Um, that strategy just is not very effective. So and that's that's pretty counterproductive, but that that's how that's how reality works. <laughs> that's that's the model that I use and that's a model that um a lot of organizations are starting to use um, and, and adopting self-management practices and they, they end up being much more effective, they end up being much more uh, fulfilling for people who work in them and and in the end that's, you know, creates a better better world for everybody else. So how do we get to this topic? We were talking about um, authenticity at the beginning and yeah, so now in the last 10 minutes or so while I was talking, I forgot about um, your perception of me and, and you will notice that I was a lot more in flow, I was a lot more confident, I was a lot more at ease when I was talking like that. Whereas at the beginning, probably my speech was more um, more stuttery, I was I was not sure of what I was saying, and, and, and now it's coming back. Um, and, and I probably had a lot of the, more of these filler words. And this is the key point, right? The key point is that when we are aware of, when we are thinking about other people's perception of us, we really, really, really struggle to be authentic because unconsciously, even if not consciously, we're trying to manage people's expectations. So that's a thought for today. Thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you next time. Ciao.